But now it's my um, absolute privilege to introduce um, Michael O'Sullivan. He comes from a unique background and set of experiences and he has developed an uncompromising approach to architecture that is both pragmatic and beautiful in its resolution and execution. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Michael O'Sullivan, Petuna Lecturer 2022. Yours, cuz. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, th and thank you for making the effort to come out on a funny old Saturday night. And, th and to you, Nick, thank you very much for your, your kind words. In 2016, I took all the kids to Ireland to show them what sort of gene pool they came from, and then take them on a tour of significant worship spaces around that land. And um, this, this Catholic monastery is a world heritage island called Skellig Michael, and it's 15 miles into the Atlantic Ocean from where Dad was born in Castletown Beer. I understand that the Irish sent all their best thinkers, prophets, poets, theorists and writers there simply so they could get to know themselves. And the monks caught fish, they grew potatoes, ate birds' eggs, they fought off Vikings, and uh, they spent most of their time in prayer between the 6th and 13th century. This was a common expression during the tour. <laughs> but the point I was trying to get across to the kids was that a thoughtfully considered worship space uh, should be like a thoughtfully considered domestic space and that its sole purpose was to inspire you to be the best <clears throat> that you could be regardless of the challenge in front of you, be it the 6th or the 21st century. This Catholic church, St Angus and Donegal, was the Irish building of the century in 1962. It's a magical thing that sits on the brow of a hill in a magnificent landscape not dissimilar to central Otago. Stone from the existing castle was reused, rainwater heads discharged into ceremonial baptismal fonts, hand cast bronze handles, elegantly proportioned windows and this, a light spire that you could boot. There were hand carved uh, stations of the cross from Irish oak. Dad, is that where our prayers are meant to go? I think so, Mary. Just don't get too close to it. If I had to vote for a New Zealand building of the 18th century, it would be Rua's courthouse. I just love the way his afro determines the entranceway in the bottom right-hand image. <laughs> but back in Ireland, this would have been St Patrick's courthouse, a watering hole where he baptised people, drank from and possibly did watercolour paintings from when he wasn't on the hunt for snakes. But this is one place where I do watercolour paintings from, uh, and it's part of the process of our job that I wish we could do a lot more of. So I try and spread it, uh, spread it right across this full spectrum of the role, from the atmospheric representations of land, sea, sky, or simply the energy of the land, to the rising and the setting of the sun or the moon, to the possible formation of something in plan in light of the shortest and longest days, to details at one to one, two, five, ten, and the odd castle. Then into something that inevitably might represent a built form, this being a, a vineyard and restaurant and sort of conference facility we're working on. But this project here is in Ōnuku, just past Akaroa, and uh, it's notable for being the first place where the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, as well as where Tarapraha ran amok. And so land, it used to be smothered in an enormous tow trail. The landscape now is incredibly masculine and, and somewhat unforgiving without that totra. And this is Kate uh, setting up a picnic on the actual site where we want to build this retreat, looking north over the Marae to Bosu, Wainui and the peninsula known as Ōniwa. In both our North and South Island studios we model everything no matter what scale the project is. Uh, this retreat in Ōnuku is 57 square metres and it has a 23 square metre two bedroom mezzanine and a little rooftop floriette. And modelling it at sort of 1 to 50 allows us to resolve many structural, constructional and compositional matters. You sort of enter the space through a sensual compression limb, a bit like Rua's courthouse. I just now need to get the clients to grow square afros. 
And there's a clear plastic downpipe in the interior of the space that allows you to see the water being caught off the roof, discharging into a tank below it. And the intention here was to set up this sort of calm repose upon the land for this young family so they can watch its regeneration back to what it might have been when Moa walked among, walked among the Totara. I think 90% of the country would have loved to have been inside Bill's head when he was painting these things. I often wonder whether the mower had entered his head as well. This may well have been the last photo of him in his Littleton studio painting away, and we were doing some work on his double-storey villa at the time. When I'd asked him if I could mod model in Rhino three of his creatures and then build them human scale out of resin and then put them in our garden looking down to his studio, he looked at me pretty strange and went, that's a pretty cool idea, but I'm not sure why you'd want to do that. <laughs> Anyway, when he had moved on, I approached uh, our neighbour, who was the council consultant um, for you know, art among, in, in Christchurch as a city, and suggested that we did it on a much larger scale, 12 to 18 metres high, and locate three of them in the centre of the roundabout when you come out of the Littleton Tunnel. And the council were right behind it and thought it a beautiful way to celebrate him. They would be positioned looking towards his final resting place, and Kitty rightfully asked Bill's family, and they said, well, it might be a bit too early, but... Uh, I love the idea that you could drive through the tunnel and see nothing but lavender, bees and legs. <laughs> the Moriori on the Chatham Islands have the longest covenant of peace of any people on the planet. And you can kind of see this positive impact that the covenant has had in the eyes of the islanders today. They are uh, inventive, resilient, fearless and, and highly productive. I tried to get um, Matthew Ridge to go for a swim with me when we were there last year, but he wasn't having a bar of it for some reason. Anyway, when we got to the airport to go to Pitt Island, the, the pilot said he had to warm up his chopper, and he'd flown over, um, he'd flown over where we were going to go for a swim, and he saw this thing, seven metres long, swimming inside the breakers, only 50 metres from the shore. Matthew Ridge then spent the rest of the afternoon, the rest of the trip, looking over his shoulder at me. <laughs> And we've just finished a small two-bedroom home uh, for a friend of mine halfway between Waitangi and Owinga on the Chathams, and he's a fisherman who swims with these things, diving for power, craze, and blue cod, and he currently dives up to 20 metres in depth for an enormous scallop species that the Hong Kong Chinese are addicted to. The home is completely reliant on the energy from the sun and the wind, and it's a testament to the attributes I mentioned earlier about the covenant of peace and influencing the people. It's seven metres long we would have been an hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> I mean, or Matthew might have been an hors d'oeuvre, I might have been a starter, but... Um, <laughs> everything had to come from New Zealand. 60 tonnes of concrete aggregate was in one ship, and the home was a primary structure of just lightweight steel portals and DHS rafters to mitigate shipping costs. And the home was orientated north-south with a focus back, uh, with a view back to Waitangi and the setting sun. And this is a view of the, from the kitchen um, with Matthew looking over his shoulder. John and Bridget chose the site on the Priest family farm as John was taken by sightings of the endangered yellow-breasted Chatham Island parakeet uh, in the bush to the north. And with that, he cut a driveway in with a D8 and a digger two kilometres long to get to the desired site. And you can kind of see a road at the top right-hand corner. And he had cut a road through a quarry, across a stream, through the mangrove marshlands and up the hill so he could be beside this bush. Solar panels are elevated and away from any cattle, and the cray pots that need to be welded up and maintained uh, using welders and grinders, etc., are done so on that concrete slab in front of the garage. And you can kind of see the native bush where the endangered parakeet resides to the north of the home. And Bridget now takes visitors on tours through this native stand. And the lockdowns have been fantastic for the island, as many New Zealanders went there simply to get away. But wind and wild weather are a huge factor on the Chathams. Trees are famously horizontal due to the incredible wind pressure. And Bridget's brief to me was concise and clear. Michael, I could be stuck in this bloody thing for three weeks at a time, so it better be good. <laughs> That's the sort of brief you don't need to write down. And this is a 30-seat worship space on the Chathams. It's a place where people would have come together to say goodbye to loved ones, celebrate weddings, or simply seek solace and inspiration uh, regardless of what they believed. This is the township of Waitangi. The red circle is where the worship space is. 
the arrow was where the shark was, and John and Bridget's um, home was where the X is. And the Moriori had this tradi traditional waka made of korari and bull kelp for buoyancy, and they reputed he could take up to 30 people on voyages between the islands, and it was intended to allow water to penetrate through the hull so they could get over breakers and, and navigate big seas. And it was something that I thought could be used conceptually in this worship space and that light could act like the water through the waka and filter gently through the space. And the foam sort of rises to meet the view north and up the beach, while light could gently wash through at foot level, just like the waka. But the Chathams are a magnificent, wild set of landscapes, the primal and the inspirational, and they're well worth a visit. But back in the South Island, the Free Wesleyan Church of Tonga were gifted land in Wigram uh, to establish a base. And we were asked to explore relocating a classroom onto the land for the purposes of a hall, but we couldn't find anything remotely suitable, so we drew up a very simple 400 square metre building that was built for around 2,000 bucks a square metre. And halfway through documentation, the church said, why don't we make it a worship space? And at every turn, the project was full of ritual. Here, the first foundation ceremony. And at the opening ceremony a couple of months ago, the building was dressed in beautifully woven flora and fauna, and hundreds of people had turned up from all over the country to celebrate. This is the view of the building looking back to Banks Peninsula. And the gifted land is smack in the middle of suburban mediocrity. I just certainly hope that the neighbours like Sunday morning singing because it's beautiful. And the interior is full of beautiful Pacific-inspired colours and textures. And with a ceiling from burnt Portuguese cork, it's intended to emulate the inside texture of a coconut shell. And the, this cork is typically used for insulation of homes in Europe is that it's basically the leftover of the cork tile process that is then put into a big press and cooked, and then it's chopped up. And Grant England, the carpenter, was just exceptional to work with on this project right through the uncertainties of all the lockdowns. But the January volcanic eruption and subsequent tidal wave caused absolute mayhem in Tonga, and people have been living like this since then. We'd come up with an emergency structure that was 4.8 by 7.2 in size, it would be perfect for a home, school, worship space, or merely gathering while the people of Tonga could, could, back, could get back on their feet. And we'd made a prototype uh, based on a kit of parts that could be put into a cargo net and then dropped onto the outlying islands with the New Zealand Air Force Sea Sprite helicopter and then assembled within an hour. And most of the outlying islands like Atata don't even have a wharf, hence the need for a Sea Sprite. But with the best intentions from this country, the unit price was like 9,800 bucks each and we could get out of China for 2,300. We then had a meeting with the minister responsible for such decisions and she said, pretty much, nah, it's not our problem. This is a cute little exercise pavilion and onsen at the back of an exquisitely restored Californian bungalow in Onihanga in South Auckland. And there's really something quite beautiful about a simple building that can be either completely open or completely closed. Adjustable cedar blades are sort of lined up with the structural system of the building and six millimeter stainless steel rope and tensions are used for wall plane bracing. There are no visible fixings in the, in the pavilion and Glenn, Tig and Naomi, the carpenters, put it together like a jewelry box. There's a cedar tub at the rear and space at the front uh, for exercise and the roof is made from Damplon out of Jerusalem that sits under this beautiful magnolia tree. So dappled light adds to the whole drama when the blades are closed and the wind is blowing and you're sitting inside this tub. Ole tangata maulona inga, ole tangata maulona faasa moanga. Every person belongs to a family and every family belongs to that person. And in these homes in um, uh, semi-rural Christchurch, three generations live under one theatrical central roof, a bit like in the Samoan village Fale. Built on a floodplain, um, the last thing I wanted the homes to suffer from was that it was dictated by that control. The homes hold a very simple sort of Claude Megson theory of compression and expansion, and this shot of the back of the Western home cleverly captures the compression with the half moon above. Two cows, two chimneys. And with a simple pallet of native recycled timbers inside, it was intended that families and any visitors be instantly relaxed, warm and inspired. And this is Rob and Christine's bedroom at the western end of the homes. The radiators that Rob had imported from England are just amazing. He had them repowder coated to try and calm down a wee bit. 
and the void in the centre of the, is used for the parking of cars and kids' birthdays parties and all manner of children's activities like bike riding and skateboarding and hockey practice. It is a set of homes that delivers a sense of love and nurture that warms my heart simply because Rob, the grandfather, built it with love and nurture. But love is a dangerous word in the game of architecture. I was 21 when Nick Stanish put his hand on my shoulder and he said, this game is a lot like love, Michael. You've got to learn how to let go just at the right time. And the studio I built in Littleton is put together only on love. And we've just added to it accommodating a library, workstations and Mariah style sleeping. It also showcases an aluminium joinery system that Andrew and I have been working on for the last five years. It's being a contemporary play on the English steel joinery from the 1860s. Fully welded is intended to be a sort of central response reaction to the box section that we're so acclimatised to, and mullions, jams, sills and sash frames are meant to be exciting and provocative to touch. You can kind of see that in the extrusions at the top of the drawing and on the left hand side. We covered three suites, uh, fixed glass, side hung sash or door and an external slider. And we had it tested to a very high wind pressure according to NZS 4211. And with handles uh, built into the extrusion and exposed stainless steel rollers, it certainly uh, has exceeded our expectations. The whole extension was constructed and then carved internally by Alistair, uh, and it is intended that when you're inside the space looking south, um, it makes you painfully aware of the sky, the mountains and the water in that order. This home on Waiheke Island had its own hate blog. Uh, I didn't read any of it, but apparently there were some real crackers on it. Richard, Richard, the owner, he was an English fella, had told me that one of the comments was that the home was an act of architectural arrogance. And Ian Hathfield had heard about this, and he rang me up and told me that it was a great achievement. <laughs> and that made me laugh because I didn't really know what the achievement was. Anyway, the front faces north onto what used to be the island's tennis court, uh, which is now a magnificent private garden for... Richard and Anna and the kids. And if we could measure architecture by love, then surely the barometer is watching your client's kids grow up in the home that you've just drawn for them. Uh, I, I love this shot of Sid. This kid must be 16 now. But this guy, uh, he built this house and he built many of our homes. Eight weeks ago, he died in my arms. He made the job of being an architect in this country and across the Pacific an absolute joy. The last thing he heard on this planet was my voice saying to him, you are the most wonderful human I've ever met and I love you with all my heart. And with that, he must have thought, okay, it's time to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes courage for someone to ring up an architect and say, uh, would you be interested in, expect in interpreting my expectations? And it takes equal faith for that someone to then have a carpenter deliver such ideas. And if the word mana is measured in courage and faith in parlingy eyes, then this guy was sitting in the cream of the pavlova of mana. Another project he built was the additions and alterations to this workingman's cottage in, in Onihanga for Jason and Janine. This is the extension of it from the rear. The kitchen and dining. And he would always ask obvious questions like, why is it called a working man's cottage? I bet you it was the woman that did all the work in it. <laughs> so he changed its name to the working woman's cottage. Fafatailaba, city fafo, until we meet again, also. At the other end of the country in Cass Bay is a home on the edge of Littleton Harbour and it's a play on that liquid nature of that huge explosion, explosion that is uh, the, caldera of, the, the caldera of Banks Peninsula. So three bedrooms, three levels, three bathrooms, five supercars and an underground movie theatre sort of carefully arranged on this tight um, organic footprint. The upper level has numerous incisions in the roof form to get the most out of the star, star and sky sets. And summer and winter are diametrically opposed in that summer there are literally hundreds and hundreds of people wanting to be at the beach and in winter there's no one. And this drawing shows the start point of a masonry privacy wall where most people would congregate in summer before they headed down to the beach. But what was built looked nothing like these drawings as we spent many evenings rearranging the blocks on site. There was much satisfaction in putting together all the built-in furniture for the home, and Brad was instrumental in pulling the whole thing together. So thank you, Brad. 
for all your great energy. And its relationship to Mount Herbert and Quail Island drove many of the proportional and compositional decisions on site as the project was unfolding, just like the masonry privacy wall. We changed much of the drawings while the process of construction was well underway. It's really rare to have families that are so generous that they wish to share the, the process of our game with every and anyone. And Aaron and Christine and Laura and Emma, thank you for your courage and your faith and your incredible generosity. And to Dave Walker for putting it all together. <laughs> this three bedroom home in Taupo for Charles and Colleen looks over the lake and, and south to the mountains. And their daughter Emily is a celebrated architectural photographer who, who works in New York now. And when this project was in the conceptual stage in the studio, a well-respected architect was looking at the model for a long time and after a, a few moments of uncomfortable silence said, hmm, it reminds me of the anus of a cat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, cat's anuses aside, it has a central north-facing courtyard which allows a reprieve from the bitter wind off the lake and again, plenty of built-in furniture making the home a beautiful home for all four seasons. Elevated above the street and intensely landscaped east, west, north and south, agrarian, native, formal and utilitarian, the home carefully sets up suspense and anticipation and was beautifully composed by Beck Carpenters in, in Taupo. I once heard Tony Watkins, uh, Tony Watkins say that it takes 50 years to get a family home right and when we'd started this home 13 years ago in Mangri, I put a lot of leftover materials under the house. And a lot of those leftovers at the time were used to make bunks and other built-in furniture. And the home still serves us well to this day. It, it, it's always a treat to come over to this dining room table, thanks to Sam from IMO. But the lockdowns and Schedule 1 of the building code have been fantastic. We got all the kids out to, to get all the materials out from under the house and we built a boxing ring out the back using primarily hand tools. Using just a handsaw, hammer and nails gave them great appreciation of how rewarding it is to put something together with a bit of time and lots of really bad humour. The boxing ring went to the side and the new hangout space has given the kids much more than what they had imagined. This is another beautiful product from uh, Portugal, a, a burnt cork tile. In the far north in the settlement called O'Highway is, o is, is a 159 square metre three bedroom home for a couple in their 80s. The outcrop of rocks to the left is known as Lover's Leap in the middle of the farm and it's far away from the old homestead that Sam was born in and, and spent 80 years in. And Chris and Sam still make produce on the farm today that is sold at the Kiri Kiri markets and online. The home is full of colour, and rich textures and incredible paintings and Hudnavasta was a friend of the family would often visit the farm. But the idea that a home act as a health retreat becomes really important in your 8th, ninth, and 10th decades. This home has given Sam who has just beaten bowel cancer and Chris a new lease of life since they moved in. And thank you, Andrew Lodge, for putting the home together so beautifully. Maori advocate that there are 10 levels to heaven, and I kind of like that idea. I think I'd struggle spending, on the, spending eternity on the same level as quite a few people. Um, and it just, it's a nice idea that you could change level when you felt like it. I claim that beautiful and purposeful architecture resides somewhere between one's Modi, M-A-U-R-I. Did I say that right today, Henry? Yeah, uh, it's which, is your, which is your life force and wide or being the spirit of, be it the land or the bespaced heavens. And if that's the case, then the State House of the 1960s must reside up around Tafaki, which is six to nine on this scale here. This Littleton State House underwent a serious number recently. It has a new elevated public pavilion that hovers above the existing State House, stitching Quail Islands with Mount Evan and Herbert. The cordati for this north-facing deck is lashed to a steel frame that I welded up for Linda and Alistair on the hottest Canterbury day I can remember. And it takes the bite out of the Canterbury sun in the height of summer as well as create lovely shadows on the deck and inside the home. The elevated pavilion has, is for family time only. There's no TV operating at this level and the energy here is sensational for that exclusion. 
audiovisual activities are in the existing state house in a chocolate lined space that is perfect for music and movies, a space that Anthony Hoti called the disco room. <laughs> Browntown builders and Alistair put this home together with pure passion. And alterations and additions of another sort is this concrete villa in Mount Eden, which we've just done. The brief Bridget gave me for this house, for this home, would make any architect salivate. She said, I work really hard, and when I come home, I want to think that I'm on holiday. And I, I, really, I was really quite tickled by that. So a heated freshwater pool and ample, ample tropical landscaping and, and a north-facing sun space certainly helps with days like we've had in the last month. And my utmost respect goes out for the medical profession and surgeons in particular, what they do in our society. So that certainly helped me pour the right amount of passion and love into this project. Ergen is the Irish word for ocean and skamal for cloud. And between and on the edge of them both lies this retreat at the top of the Coromandel Peninsula. A seven bedroom multi-generational hideaway in Opito Bay. There's a triple height void in the middle of the plan to assist with clarifying what is public and private. The lower public, le lower public level has the walls longitudinally leaning out as an act of openness and the triple height void hovers over the kitchen, bouncing light around. The upper level, being the private realm, have the walls leaning in as an act of closure. And we'd put together an old school fibrous plaster tile, a bit like these ones on the Station of the Cross, uh, based on the section plan and an axonometric of the retreat to be read concurrently. Uh, and this was used to create the schema layer within the home. So different, two different tiles were staggered, flipped, and rotated to capture the rhythm of the day. This is the main bedroom looking out to Great Mercury Island. And this is looking back to the main bedroom from the beach through the tussock. Paul Sayers, Paul Sayers Carpenter did a magnificent job in putting this together so seamlessly. And in the middle of the Waikato, Matt and Winnie had asked us to draw up a small home for them. They didn't have any kids when we first started. Now they've got two beautiful children. The home sort of tumbles down this cliff underneath a single roof plane with a clerestory window framing the northern sun and the Waikato River. And the, the 1962 Woolley Home in Sydney by Ken Woolley has a very similar topography to the site. And I was really intrigued by the sleeving of space that he had achieved under a series of four different roof planes. And Matt had introduced me to the ease of getting bu building materials out of China, which has been hugely inspirational. Here, wingy veneered plywood lines the whole interior of the home, making the kids feel like they live inside a chocolate cake. From the street, you've got no idea what lies below the block wall balustrade. And Matt had also uh, purchased his own CNC machine that he had made, and he had made everything from the doors and window frames, lights, kitchen and laundry cabinetry, book and wardrobe shelving, and privacy screens, including the cutest kids' beds on the planet. And these double rectilinear downpipes sums the whole family up to me. That is, if you don't have families who are invested in the in the whole process, this game can be really hard work. Matt's dad put together the downpipes, gutters, and rainwater heads that are mirrored at the street front on the garage. The Colorado River in Austin, Texas is similar to the Waikato in that it's peppered with hydro dams. An actor had contacted me to uh, look at putting together a retreat for himself so he can play country music on the banks of the river and get away from the madness of Hollywood. So I went up there for 10 days and I put together a scheme that we used to hold talks with the city of Austin planning and building departments and then discussions with carpenters. And the great thing about the Lone Star State is that the planning and building rules are really light and the architect is responsible for full compliance. And this is what it should be like in this country. And I had a meeting with a confident 20 something year old duty planner who had explained to me in three minutes what the rules were and then, then spent the next half hour asking me questions. And he kept on calling me boy. <laughs> boy, where y'all from? <laughs> New Zealand. New Zealand? Ain't that up around Montana ways? <laughs> no, it's in the South Pacific, mate. The South Pacific? Wow, where on God's earth is that? And I'd given him a book on the New Zealand landscape and he thought that that was licensed for him to be able to ask me anything, and it wasn't ready for what was coming next. 
He must have looked at me and thought I was a good old boy. And it was the last year of Obama's presidency, and he asked me what he thought of the, us having a president of that colour. And I said to him, well, if he was the president of New Zealand, I think we'd be pretty happy with him. You know, he's done some wonderful things like your Obamacare. He goes, well, hell, boy, where you all been having your head for the last nine years? <laughs> I thought, shit, I don't know. We're clearly not in Texas. <laughs> Anyway, this is a Texas barbecue breakfast. <laughs> this is what he gave me to get around on. <laughs> Something quite free about riding down the motor without a helmet and the wind through your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I got to swim in this uh, beautiful hole every day. And I went to five different country music gigs in five days, including, including Robert Earl Keane. But the year I was there... Um, most people were, were terribly polite and predominantly God-fearing, but the year I was there, Texas lawmakers had approved open-carry gun laws, and it was obvious everywhere you went, um, including the Robert Earl Keane concert, so I was certainly marning my P's and Q's. Back down in central Otago, um, Tim and Ingrid had built a compact little home in Arrowtown in a historic zone that required us to go to every person in the street and beg for forgiveness the home was wrapped in hop dip galvanised corrugate and I had reference in my assessment of environmental effects, the Chinese miners' huts in Arrowtown and the council were just simply scratching their heads at that. The only thing the council said was, won't it be a bit shiny? I said, no, she'll be right. Give it a couple of weeks, it'll patina off and it'll look just like those miners' huts. <laughs> it took about four years for the patina to wear off. And it didn't help that Tim and Ingrid kept on wearing Ray-Bans everywhere. <laughs> but Tim had trained as a carpenter straight out of school and, like Matt and the Waikato, had built just about everything in the home. We went down there to help him put his roof on at mid-30s temperatures. This is the front door, which was meant to emulate a, a crevasse in a glacier. This is from the interior. I've only had a handful of homes where people who have engaged me to do the drawings have then sold the home. And when Tim rang me up to say that somebody wanted to buy his house, I was fuming, farting and spitting like my valiant on the motorway. <clears throat> but I could hear Nick Stanish saying in my ear, let it go, Michael. Just like on that Vogels ad on TV. But now William and Yoko live there and they love it as much as I do, so life goes on. Still in central Otago and others who liked uh, Tim and Ingrid's home, had asked us to look at a property just up the road, and the lunar-like landscape of Alexandra was perfect for Russell and Anne Beck to build their retreat upon. Their son is the very impressive Peter Beck of Rocket Lab, and their family is testament to the theory that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Russell got to spend one summer in the home before he had moved on, and he told me that it was the best summer he'd had on this planet, and that certainly made water get in my eyes. He was an acclaimed geologist, master of greenstone and civic sculptor. He had taught us so much about the various rock formations and the reasons why they and we were here and there. And Peter had sent this thing into the atmosphere after his dad had moved on and I was simply amazed that it could be visible from Earth as it tore around the atmosphere before it disintegrated. Back in the North Island on the west coast of Auckland is a small home that we'd done uh, for an equally impressive couple in the form of Barbara and Bob. And this is a very old photograph of the watchman out at Kerry Kerry. It's a 130 square metre two bedroom home around an intimate courtyard. And it acts as an affront to the rigours of the wild west coast. Um, but being very public and well known members of the community, they got the full treatment of the district plan in the madness of the Resource Management Act. And it was this project here where I was first introduced to the idea of getting local iwi to bless the whole process of, the game, of our game. <clears throat> Feasibility, initial thoughts, opening up of the land and then occupation. Having each, blessed stay, having each stage blessed is something I really enjoy now. And Bob Harvey is a highly calibrated cat. I love collecting the black sand from the beach and then layering up the floor as we sealed it with layers of lacquer and the cracks that had occurred naturally in the slab I'd filled with little copper shavings just before the last coat of lacquer, though now this delicious green colour. It's an idea that I pinched off Frank after visiting Falling Water, where he had shellacked the stones inside the main living room to look like the bed of the waterfall. And it's really important to dream in this game. 
I've always imagined having a snooze on that day bed. Uh, but it's all part of letting go, I suppose. In, in gentrified suburban Christchurch is a garden like thousands of others that were liberated from their old homes thanks to the shakes. Um, and this home for Scott and Tina has a plan that's gently curved to get the most out of the sun across all four seasons. The streetscape faces east and carefully conceals a formal garden and courtyard that enjoys the rising of the sun. And the level of craftsmanship in this home is up there with the best of boat building in New Zealand, thanks to a guy called Sam McCarthy. And at the end of the day, the main bedroom is saturated in the setting sun, and it's one of the most proportionally beautiful bedrooms I know. It has a strong relationship to the pepper tree outside that had informed the, ceiling ce the cedar ceilings. Sam the carpenter had ripped 3,500 lineal metres of 140 by 20 coiler decking into thirds using my table saw to make this beautiful veranda. And once he had finished it, a supplier had seen the potential and then had released a 45 by 20 board. <laughs> <laughs> it's a truly beautiful home that carefully respects the family and the garden it spent 25 years to develop. In gentrified suburban Devonport, this home would not even survive the drawing board without the help of Graham Burgess, architect. Hard on the footpath of Jubilee Ave and north facing the mountain, the public and private realms of this home are really free and uninhibited given its stiff upper lip context. And Graham's clever referencing of the group architect's work and the subtle suggestions of period detailing allowed the commissioners to see a way through the madness of the heritage controls in this part of Auckland at the time. And it's really lovely to be able to make something for a family after years of drawing and compliance. Here I made a dining room table out of Aussie black butt and a um, up and down light that traverses both the island and the, and the table out of redwood. And like the day bed for Barbara and Bob, I would dream of having a bath here and sort of watching the ships navigate the wider matter. But back out on the west coast is a home that we've just finished and it has a powerful overall geometry that is driven by clusters of cowrie tree stands in a rural setting. The upper level main bedroom sits in, in front of a really well proportioned singular cowrie that I guess would be 50 years old. This is a 1 to 100 scale model of that bedroom. Primary and secondary forms of the home. And this is coming in from the Pacific like a kereru, a sober one. <laughs> and we've put together this 400 millimetre wide aluminium weatherboard it has a gentle curvature to it and a really rich texture. And the rest of the cladding is um, western red cedar. And the interior is lined with old carry weatherboards off a local church that had just been pulled down. And there you can see that lone carry there sitting in front of the main bedroom. And Murray Long's team were just magnificent to work with in building this home for John and Kate. There are 30 underwater volcanoes in the Kermadec Trench, and Raoul Island is an impressive outerwater volcano located halfway between here and Samoa. <clears throat> and MedService had asked us to build a stainless steel shed to accommodate two very dangerous hydrogen tanks and a proton machine that makes hydrogen for their new automated weather balloon launcher. And I said that we'd draw it up on the condition that we could go up there and put it together, and MedService asked, do architects do that? I said, yeah, 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 architects do that. We can do that. There's a practice note to that effect. I didn't say that. And so Baketech, who usually makes commercial kitchens around the Pacific Islands, built a 10 square metre shed from food hygiene grade stainless steel in Christchurch and then drove it to Devonport and we sailed three days on the HMNZS Otago to get to Raoul. And when we got there, the sea sprite had dropped it off flat packed onto the island and we spent three days putting it together in absolutely beautiful conditions. Remana and Dr Peter Wood of Victoria University came up to make it an absolutely wonderful adventure and they're both here tonight. Bake Tech and Wainoni built everything, hinges, bolts, doors, frames, vents, steps, ramps and you can see the grunty roller pin hinges and latches that they made here. And the key to handling hydrogen is making sure that there's plenty of ventilation just in case of an emergency. The hut came together seamlessly and we found ourselves with five days free. And Raoul Island has this 500 metre high mountain that Niwa were putting a 12 metre high mast on top of to keep an eye on the lake levels, seismic activity and tidal waves. And the Niwa guys hadn't prepared a critical path diagram 
uh, as to what they wanted to achieve and they accordingly found themselves short of time. And we were then asked to help uh, the Niwa guys build the guy ropes, fabricate the mast and then drop it onto its foundation using the sea sprite. The Navy, the Army, the Air Force and the Niwa uh, were just were involved in what I thought was a really cool job. And at the end of the day we were all looking forward to being uh, winched up into the sea sprite. But this fella here, um, he broke one of the 50 strands of the formal stainless steel rope. Then the Air Force said oh, it was too dangerous to risk winching anyone else up there. But I was quite happy to take that risk after such a hard day's work. But at the same time, I did wonder how many strands I might have broken. But after three days sailing in these conditions, we were really glad to get back to the wider matter. The bridge is 17 metres high, and, and, and you, off the waterline, and you can see how big some of these waves are. People including seasoned uh, yeah, Navy yeah. staff and the ship's captain were green and horizontal. Yeah. But these waves don't compare to the biggest wave this ship has ever encountered. This is a 21 metre high wave in the Southern Ocean. Keep your eye on the gun and listen to the oh. nervous chatter in the background afterwards. I see. It. <laughs> Back in Mangere, this is the biggest living room in the country. A 50 metre by 50 metre space in Favona for the Free Wesleyan Church of Tonga. Um, this building can accommodate the Tongan royal family. That comes with much protocol when considering how a space should come together. How such a space should come together. We had an opening for the building that attracted thousands of people, and this is, this is the front of the building facing north. First there were formalities with the king and queen, and on the mezzanine you can see a maple-lined alcove for the royal family. They have their own entry, kitchen and bathroom facilities, and offices that run the church nationwide are located on this mezzanine. Then the most outrageous feast I have ever seen. There was no room for a plate or cutlery at, at the table, and the kids just thought this was fantastic. Crayfish sat on top of spit-roasted pigs and this unbelievably beautiful raw fish um, dish and a dish called lou, which is beef, onions, and coconut cream wrapped in taro leaves. Whoa, man. But Tongans sure know how to have a great time. It's no wonder Cook kept on sailing back there and calling it the Friendly Islands. Little did he know. There was much dance, singing and happiness like I'd never seen before, and to be asked to be part of it is a huge honour. So Malo Pito, Frederick Feki and Semi Pulu. The first Kohonga Rio in New Zealand was started in, in Wainui Mata in 1982, and we have been lucky enough to be involved in a number of them, thanks to Kara. Thank you for coming along tonight, Kara. Uh, this particular Kohonga is at Birkdale College, it's the first pink building we've done. <laughs> it's a very rewarding topology to work on simply because you know it serves a great purpose in our society today. So much so, I offer a scholarship for kids that have been through a Kuanga Rio that then wish to study architecture at Auckland University. Here the kids are blessing the food at lunchtime and I love the little girl in the middle high seat there. You see the kid in the red, he just wants me to leave because he wants to eat. <laughs> This is the approach to the Atea. And one of the kids at this kuanga can't walk, so she drags herself around the beautiful, smooth Portuguese uh, cork floors at great speed. She's a lovely little kid. And kuanga rios are a wonderful opportunity to inject much colour and texture into a child's mind while they learn about who they are and why they're here on this planet. An industrial Christchurch is located, is located Te Hohepa kuanga rio. And it's based on a rigorous fetu, which is a star that the Kuanga has had since its inception in Christchurch nearly 25 years ago. Although I knew nothing of this when we were putting together the preliminary thinking. The fetu has these beautiful colours that we had rotated on each elevation and then tied that in with the child's development through the years they would be there, starting in the east and ending in the west. And with government funding for only 1.5 square metres per kid, 
Uh, we had suggested a central courtyard to address the shortfall of space and the bitter cold winters in Canterbury. And this kid's name is Jesse James, and he certainly lived up to that reputation of his namesake. He was just a card. And I tried to get uh, the National Trust, namely John, to buy wrestling mats for this courtyard, but he knew exactly what I was up to and he simply laughed at me. But I could see Jesse James's name at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas in 2037. <laughs> The trust did have a good budget for landscaping of the facility and it gets thrashed whenever the, the weather allows in Christchurch. But I just love the fundamentals of the koanga in that the parents are invested in the facility and the child's growth. And the Irish have a similar program funded by the government called Near School where kids are taught an almost identical curriculum. And like koanga rios, they're really hard to get into. This is the front of the Taipa koanga rio in the far north. And what I wanted to try and capture here is what a child might experience when dad or mum puts that kid to bed on a hot summer's night and he drop, they drop a sheet on the child and it gently floats down on top of that child. Most koangas have kids from all uh, manner of different iwi and hapu. Not so in Taipa, most of the kids in Ngāti Kahu. And this is a photo of the opening. And when I was invited to the opening, I put on a suit and I drove up early in the morning and there were hundreds of people present and I only knew a couple and these two seagulls. And that must have been quite obvious because I noticed the horny harawera walking towards me. <laughs> and I thought, shit, he's going to come up and say, hey, g'day, my name's Horny. Welcome to Taipa. Thanks for coming to the opening. And he walks up to me and he goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> and before I could think of a sensible answer, I was telling him a story of sorts. I said, well, you see now, I was on the southern motorway and I usually take the Oduhu off ramp and turn right, but instead I turned left and after three hours driving I ended up here. <laughs> he just looked at me and walked off. <laughs> anyway, after another three and a half hours, I was asked if I'd like to talk, and given I can't call it all, I opted to read the lyrics of Mahina Rangi Toka's song called When I Grow Up. So when the lyrics of Mahina Rangi Toka's song must have plucked a few strings because the next thing I knew I was in photographs. <laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd never met this guy before, but you've got to give it to him. His passion for his people and tikanga is uncompromising. And you can kind of see that in the interview that he has with Miriama. That's all over YouTube. I kind of like that. But the coolest thing about this photograph is the two seagulls on the roof. Mongolia is the least populated country in the world and the city of Ulaanbaatar is struggling to accommodate the influx of their traditionally nomadic people and we were asked to come up and do a presentation of different typologies using steel framing uh, on behalf of a local developer to the Mongolian government and other interested parties. And we'd come up with uh, six ideas ranging from 40 square metres up to 160 and they were based on the native alpine flowers of Mongolia because... That's all I had to go on. This is a one bedroom 40 square metre, the two bedroom 60 square metre meant to be a steel gurt, an 80 square metre that I named the Sagal Ul, and the government loved this one because this, the Sagal Ul is this beautiful little native flower that is the silver fern of Mongolia. And the three bedroom 100 square metres over two levels and a duplex with a courtyard for goats. But the main reason I went there is that I wanted to compete in a tournament called the Nadam Festival. It's a celebration of Genghis Khan's army skills that occurs every year in May. And the first of the three skills contested is wrestling. It's not like Olympic wrestling. It's based on a simple takedown. So if you put your knee, your elbow, your hand or your butt down, you're the loser. 1,092 men come onto the national stadium and it lasts for days until the last man is standing. I got the Mongolian yeah, nah. It was all good when I was in New Zealand, but when I got up there, they said, well, in 800 years, a foreigner has never competed in our game, so we're not going to start now. <coughs> Interesting, interestingly, they are bare-chested 
because one of the first nadams was won by Genghis Khan's daughter. <laughs> and they thought to avoid further embarrassment, they would come up with this rule, but I'm not sure how foolproof that rule is. <laughs> the second skill is archery, shooting a distance of 75 metres into a 75 millimetre diameter bullseye. It's incredible to see. And the third being horse riding, being a 30 kilometre race across the vast wild Mongolian landscape. When I was there, a six-year-old boy rode a six-year-old mare to win and then was an instant national hero. It's not for the faint-hearted, the majority ride without saddles, and there is an incredibly high attrition rate. And then they all head off to these um, race clubs in these supersized girts and drink copious amounts of really bad vodka. I'm not sure what was more dangerous, the horse riding or the aftermatch function. You've got an option culturally. You can either drink fermented horse milk and wash that down with a goat's cheese biscuit or drink really bad Russian vodka. So it was a pretty simple decision for me. As a country, we spent 950 million bucks on MIQ accommodation during the lockdowns with the majority of the facilities being owned by offshore companies. Quail Island would have made a sensible MIQ venue, being a former leper colony and quarantine station. Self-contained, fully insulated carbon fibre units could have been fabricated in Littleton and choppered on and off as required. And when no longer required, they could have been used as minor dwellings for the younger members of our society that are struggling to get going. Littleton would have made a great venue for a 50,000 seated stadium with a retractable roof, using the same narrative that Zaha had suggested in Muslim Qatar. New Brighton needs a counterpoint to the city of Christchurch. Andrew and Glenn, who I work with, are wonderful men and beautiful thinkers. And having a studio in each island that complements each other is a privileged thing that takes a huge amount of energy. I ask that the young men and women that work in these studios go between each so that they can get the most out of this magnificent country. This journey started when I spent a week um, with Busan and Stress Architects in Peter Bevan's Canterbury Arcade Building and both Graham and Ray were hugely inspirational at that critical age, and Graham still is to this day. The guy on the right is Nick Stanish, who taught me how to think at university. I have the highest amount of respect and love for this guy, and I'm blessed to have had the start and to have had time with these magnificent architects. There are more people alive on the planet today than those who have ever died in the history of humanity. Therefore, what we do has never been more important. Architecturally, we are privileged and spirited land, a spirited land, with, and our built environment is on top of the world. I've just made this claim based on what my eyes have told me from traveling around the planet. We have some amazing architects in this country that keep producing work that the whole world is looking at. And the guy on the left has taught and influenced most of these architects, but being an academic is a thankless role, so I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone that works in tertiary education. The guy on the right is trying to figure out what his old man does for a job. Don't worry, son, I'm still trying to figure that out too. A 95-year-old man wanted me to draw him up a letterbox once, and I'm guessing he wanted to see more letters. So I made him a model at 1 to 20, and he loved it, and then he built it. I suspect he was disillusioned and disheartened with me with digital communication. If no one ever sent me another email or text message again, I'm sure I'd be pretty happy with that. So do me a favour, everyone. Tomorrow, write a letter to somebody who you love, preferably on unlined 200-gram watercolour paper using a fountain pen. And that's all I've got to say in the matter. So thanks for coming along. Mm -hmm.